The Shooting Range. In this episode, Humble Beginnings, the amazing story of PBY Catalina and its rise to stardom. A vehicle of the space age, the M60A2 Starship. Line, the developers answer questions that you've left in the comments. But first, let's start with a guide to winning everything. How to become a better player when you're already bloody brilliant. A common scenario. You've already got to the position of your choice, and there isn't a single enemy on your radar, so nothing happens, nothing at all. Well, here is a way to kill some time while you're waiting for the opponents to arrive. Just hit Alt-Tab, check your mail and your news feed, and watch a few episodes of The Shooting Range. Quality time, you know. And you can do that in the air, RB as well. It makes climbing to high altitudes way more fun. War Thunder maps are works of art. Level designers spent countless hours making it look and feel as nice as possible. Take a minute to appreciate it every time you load to a new map. Look at this sunset in the desert. It's so beautiful it brings tears to my eyes. What about this rugged coast? Or this magnificent monument of nature? Simply stunning. Who needs real-life tourism when you can have this? Your dead-hearted teammates might not share your sentiments, but do not let them affect your choices. Battles are fleeting, but beauty is eternal. And the last thing, every now and then there comes a time when a team needs a leader, someone you'll remind everybody of their duty as soldiers. This leader is you. Of course, who else? Use the time at the start of the match to tell your subordinates what to do and where to go. Lay out your strategy for the encounter. If they do not follow your orders, that's A, mutiny, B, the exact reason why you lose. Sadly, not everyone can be a team player. Maybe you'll get better recruits next match. Pro tip, do not take this section too seriously. Next up is the vehicle that really shakes up the ATGM. There aren't that many vehicles in the game that come equipped with anti-tank guided missiles, and the precious few in the game that do lack in the armor department. This fact puts these vehicles at a disadvantage in close quarters combat and forces the players who drive them to stick to long-range fighting, which is not always viable. But the recent update introduced a vehicle that challenges the status quo. Please welcome the Starship. Great elevation angles, incredibly fast turret rotation, a stabilizer, decent mobility and speed, and all of that on top of the armor that any Sheridan or IT-1 tanker would kill for. Want to penetrate the turret from the front? Sorry mate, not an easy thing to do. The worst case scenario is that an opponent eliminates your commander through the breech end or the cupola. Don't let the enemy come to you from the sides, and you'll probably be okay. Other ATGM vehicles might have to resort to sniping. The Starship? Not so much. Heck, even close quarters urban warfare is the response option. And that's where your heat rounds come in hand. Yeah, they do not have the same penetration rates as missiles, but their muzzle velocity is much higher. In urban encounters, projectile speed is what makes you or breaks you. So feel confident to get at least 10 heat rounds every battle. By the way, if you ever find yourself in a tough spot, just deploy a smoke screen and use this opportunity to sneak away. Told you, the Starship can't do anything. All in all, that's a fantastic new addition to the American lineup. It can roll with the punches and it can dish out damage. What can we say? A couple of these vehicles can hold a flank on their own. Just don't let your opponent score any hull hits. Now. Let's speak about one of the most iconic aircraft of its era, an aircraft that had a very humble beginning. In 1927, meet Isaac Machlin Laden a young engineer at a small company called Consolidated Aircraft Corporation. His task at the time was to create a small multi-engine flying boat. A pretty regular task at that. 
Planes were constantly getting bigger, but the contemporary gear, legs and tires couldn't really hold all that weight. The solution was found rather quickly. You just had to take off from water and to land on water. In other words, it was the golden age of seaplanes. Germany had the giant seaplanes designed by Claude Dornier. Italy astonished the world with a double-hulled flying boat, Savoia Marchetti S-55. The Kawanishi Aircraft Company and the Yokosuka Naval Arsenal worked hard on their own designs in Japan, and the UK and France had so many of these machines that we could spend the whole episode just listing them. Born in a pauper Jewish ghetto somewhere in New Jersey, Isaac M. Ladden could hardly imagine that one day he would create an aircraft that would make him a living legend. All he knew for sure was that the company had to survive the Great Depression and that the competition for the army contracts was brutal. The losers would certainly find themselves on the verge of starvation. Unfortunately, this was exactly the case for Ladden. In the end, the US Navy chose a rival design, the flying boat made by Martin, and Ladden's PY was rejected. The engineer had to improvise. After some tweaking, the aircraft was repurposed as a cargo passenger plane that started flying between Rio de Janeiro and Buenos Aires. That impressed some people, and the company received an order for a few more planes of this type. Then, the Navy saw the aircraft was a success, even though it was a humble one, and suggested that Ladden should submit another design for the next multi-purpose seaplane contract. This time, he created a two-engine sesquiplane called the P-2Y Ranger that received a warm welcome from the Navy pilots. In 1935, it was followed by the PBY, an improved and less expensive two-engine flying boat with a parasol-type wing. In all honesty, there was nothing really special about it, just another useful but humble aircraft that was good at its job. And the plan was that it would be peacefully superseded by the more powerful four-engine PB2Y Coronado in 1938. But then, yeah, then the war happened. The British Purchasing Commission loved the PBY so much that the aircraft became the main patrol plane of the Royal Navy, where it received a new nickname, the Catalina. The Catalina was a great hit with the Soviet pilots as well, to an extent that Moscow bought the production license, and quite a few other countries shared the sentiment. What is interesting is that even the American pilots refused to ditch this reliable seaplane in favor of the new, more technologically advanced aircraft. And so the humble Cinderella, uh, I mean Catalina, became the superstar of the flying boat variety. It was used as a reconnaissance aircraft, a torpedo bomber, an anti-submarine plane, a transport, a flying hospital, a rescue aircraft. Uh, we can go on and on. The Catalina was everywhere. Furthermore, starting with the modified PBY-5, the Catalina got a retractable landing gear and basically became an amphibian. Where there was no way to build an airstrip, but you still needed a plane, there was always the Catalina. It became the most mass-produced amphibian seaplane in history. Then the war ended. You could assume that it meant the end for the Catalina. After all, there was already a whole range of objectively better seaplanes. You would be wrong. Consolidated was flooded with contracts from business and private individuals alike. All of them wanted a reliable and cheap seaplane. Thus, the Catalina became a passenger plane, an aerial firefighter, and even a flying yacht. Why? Get the Browning M2 machine guns out, install some leather sofas and a minibar, get some girls and go to the beach. It's damn nice to dive into the warm sky blue water from the Catalina's wing. So, what was the secret of this tremendous success? Basically, Mr. Ladden found the ideal formula for a seaplane, maybe without even realizing it. The Catalina was big enough to withstand the ocean's wave and carry enough fuel to cross the Atlantic. At the same time, it was small enough to be comfortably used by a small company or even a private owner. The years went by. We broke the sound barrier and got into space. The Consolidated Aircraft Corporation is long gone, and Isaac Ladden himself left this world in 1976. And the Catalinas are still in service. They represent a unique type of plane that doesn't really need any upgrade, period. All you left to do is admire its beauty, sitting in the blister with a fishing rod in one hand and a glass of something cold and nice in the other. Get ready for the traditional last part of our show, Hotline. Developers answering questions from the comments.
Strictly speaking, it's not the most serious-minded section of the show. If you want answers to be given with solemn faces, feel free to appeal to the official War Thunder forums. Here, we'll have a more yeah, light-hearted discussion of the big questions of War Thunder. The first message comes from a player called General Grievous. He's writing about something we said while telling you the story of the Churchill. It's called the British Army, not the Royal Army. This is because historically, while the Navy was owned by the monarch, the army wasn't. It was supplied by various noblemen and only organized into one force by the monarch. Our bad. You're absolutely right, mate. Then there is a question from the real Dino. Have you handled any real tanks for the game models? Or was it just pictures? We try to be as hands-on as possible. We work closely with a number of experts, museums, and even owners of private collections. And when you have real drivable vehicles around, it makes our job much, much easier, especially when recording sounds. Albin Alivius writes, Are you the guys even aware of how unbalanced all the Italian jets are? Are they? If you notice a pattern or see a problem, feel free to submit a report at our official forums. We really do appreciate it. Feda asks, Can you please say something in the next episode about M41 Walker Bulldog? Can't see why not. It's a very interesting vehicle. We'll try to have a section dedicated to it in one of our future episodes. And the last, very important question by Salter Ad. Will I be able to put bushes on my PT boat? I need the extra stale. Hell yeah. And whole trees are even groves on a destroyer. Look, I'm an island. That's it for today, but feel free to write your questions in the comments below. We do read them all, and you might see some of them answered in the next episode. If you like what we're doing, then don't forget to subscribe to our channel. See you on the shooting range.